order to try to understand how, how, this, how this phenomenon works, right? What are the mechanisms, what, and how do, we, how do we translate those mechanisms forward into getting new treatments for this disease? Um, so the way I had this talk divided, uh, it's really about three people. One is Lori, uh, one is Philip, and one is Rita. And with Lori, we're going to talk about something called, um, well, we're going to talk about migraine. Can you guys hear me all okay? By the way, if, I talk, if I'm talking while writing? Okay. Um, talk about migraine itself. What is it? And also something called the pain matrix. Um, with Philip, we're going to talk about uh, migraine, I'll just put M, as uh, a central nervous system or a peripheral nervous system process. And we'll, we'll define our terms as we go along. Um, and with Rita, we're going to talk about something called cortical spreading depression, or CSD. And then as we talk about this, we'll talk about a little bit about the anatomy. I don't expect you guys to know, you know, some of these terms or anything like that. But what is the anatomy telling us, and what is the physiology telling us? What are what are we getting from our recordings? Um, and some of this work is in humans, and some of this is is in animals. So let's talk about Lori first. So Lori is uh, she's 43. She's had chronic migraine for probably 15 years, um, and. It's, it's completely disrupted her life, and she's a, um, she's a pistol. She's, a, you know, I, I, I like her very much, but by the way, I've changed the names to protect the innocent, etc. cetera, and, and a lot of these, these folks are not from here in Utah. They're, they're from previous places I've been. Um, she's a pistol, and she's sort of seen as a troublemaker in clinic because she expresses herself very volubly um, and, and, you know, lets people know what she's feeling, which is, absolutely terrible. Her life has been up, up ended. Um, so, and, and what, what Lori asked me one day was, you know, this is, this is more than physical pain. This is mental pain. This is, this is just this, this scourge on my life. What, what gives? How does this work? Um, so, Lori, of course, is right. This is something that's, that's more than just physical pain. Um, and we think we have some understanding of that. And I'm just going to cue myself off some of my slides here. Um, I think what, I'm not going to draw all the figures that were, that were in there, but um, some things are probably important. Um, so one thing we want to know about migraine is it's obviously more than just the attack, right? But during the attack, you have a lot of different features, right? You've got pain. Everyone thinks, oh, it's just head pain. But everyone knows who has migraine that's way more than that, right? There's these sensory amplifications, right? Photophobia, light hurts. Phonophobia, sound hurts. Your whole sensory system's had its volume knob turned up, right? Um, and then there's autonomic changes. What's autonomic? Uh, that's your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. They get activated whenever pain gets activated. These are, these are how your body uh, keeps itself whole, right? It's, 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 it's maintaining homeostasis, the, the normalcy of, of bodily function. Um, so that's the attack. But plenty of people have something that precedes the attack, right? An aura, right? Um, some people have, even before the attack, a prodrome. Right? This could be up to 72 hours before the attack. So things are going on in the nervous system that aren't just the attack. Right? Um, an aura is actually a, a, a hallucination. Right? It's something that doesn't exist in the environment. It's, it's a, usually sensory, but it can be motor. It can be speech. Right? You can have word finding difficulty or even speech arrest. Um, and so there's, this, is, this is obviously something very profound happening in the nervous system before the attack. And we'll talk about that a little bit. After the attack, you, have, you can have a post-drome, 
or some of us call this a migraine hangover, right? Because the day after it's not the same, your brain is not the same and you do not feel the same. You cough and you still feel the soreness where your headache was, right? So you still have the pain and you still have the sensory amplifications. And then finally, there's what we call the interictal stage, right? That's between attacks. And that's when things can either go really well, you go evolve to a very episodic migraine, you just take occasional medications, you feel better, or it can go very poorly and you progress toward when this, is, this, this horrible experience is a daily thing. And factors that can, that can tip things, right? Hormones. Sorry about my writing. Um, stress. Um, and what I'm going to call the affective disorders, the emotional disorders, which are part of the brain as well, right? Depression, anxiety. Um, and then, very importantly, uh, there's, I'm going to call this iatrogenic. What, the, what does that mean? That's what doctors do to you. So there's what you do to yourself and what your doctor does to you, hopefully well-meaning, hopefully the right thing, but a lot of, we're in an opioid epidemic where people are treating migraine with opioids, for example, and that's, that's one of the worst things you can do for migraine. If you're on it, it's not the end of the world. You, you, you can change things slowly. But the idea is that actually sometimes medications make migraine worse, and I think you all know that, right? So it's much more than just the attack, right? Now if you try to place all these features on the brain, so I'm trained as a neurologist, the, our job is where is the lesion? Where is the one place that can cause all this stuff, right? And neurologists get frustrated when you can't find that one spot, right? So there's a stroke and it causes weakness here and speech difficulty there and all this stuff and it's all this one in one place or there's a tumor that's pressing on just this one place and causing these effects. Well, for migraine that's not the case. If you map this stuff on a brain, I'm going to draw a very primitive looking brain here. Um, it goes everywhere. These features go all over the brain. And what this means, this frustrates a neurologist, and this is why so migraine is sometimes sort of a uh, second class citizen in neurology, which is very silly. Um, but it it frustrates neurologists because it is all over the place. What that means, that's actually good information. That means that this is not a degenerative disease. It's not a stroke. It's not a tumor. It's a circuit disorder, right? The wiring is ostensibly normal, but it's been tweaked. The volume knob has been turned up. And that brings us back to Lori. So I, I think of migraine as a disorder of gain or volume. And it has three categories, sensory, autonomic, uh, and affective, right? So sensory, pain, but also the sensory amplifications. Autonomic, most prominent one is nausea, right? But there are other ones. There's flushing uh, of the face, tearing of the eyes, pallor. That's all your autonomic ner nervous system reacting. And then affective, right? This is, without understanding this, you don't understand migraine, right? Physical pain begets mental pain. That's normal, that's how pain works. So if you have pain every single day of your life, if you're not depressed, then really I, I wanna know what you're smoking or taking or something, right? Because it, it makes no sense, right? So sensory, autonomic, and affective gain, the volume now has been turned up, and I have this picture of, uh, this heavy metal artist whose amplifiers go to 11, but I, I can't draw him. Um, so what do I tell Lori? Yes, your experience is valid. It's real. It's profound. It's probably one of the bigger parts of your experience that, you know, life hurts, right? Not just my head hurts. And that is incredibly important. We need to realize that. Society needs to realize that. And as scientists, we need to realize that because we need to study the circuits where this gets generated. And there is, that, that's where the pain matrix comes in. So, um, I don't want to belabor this too much, but it is important to, to think about. So, when sensory information comes into the brain, it comes in through the spinal cord and brainstem here. 
And this is sort of the primitive part of the brain, just early processing. But pain information is very different from normal sensory information. Normal sensory information comes in, gets relayed in something called the thalamus, goes to sensory cortex. Say I, I, I reach out and touch something, right? It's not painful. When a painful stimulus, so, so say I reach out and touch something and a little crab bites me or something, right? That's a very different thing. It's not just this relaying of a signal uh, in, in a single line up to your, your cortex where you perceive it. What happens is it goes into a relay center in the, in, the, in the hindbrain, and then from there, it parallelizes out. It turns into multiple streams of information. And these multiple streams go to parts of the brain involved in pain control. So... This is where opiates work, for example. You have endogenous opiates in the body. They suppress pain, but they also then turn up the volume knob for later. Uh, this is a big discussion we can have. Your hypothalamus gets activated. Your locus ceruleus is in, uh, 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 your fighter, uh, a center that starts off the fight or flight response gets activated. All this stuff is happening, and this is going down and priming the body, right? This thing just bit me. I don't know what this is. I'm freaked out. What, what the heck's going on, right? It's an alerting, right? Um, that's going on below conscious awareness. But then that message, which has gone up to the cortex, you, you feel the, the feeling of it, or you're aware of it. It goes not just to that sensory cortex. It goes to all sorts of different places, a place called the insula, which is what integrates your feeling of, of the body, and it may be part of your feeling of yourself as, as, as an embodied thing. Um, it goes to your anterior cingulate cortex, which is involved in setting the emotional tone to the information that, that you're getting. It goes to the amygdala, which is very, very involved in setting the, in shading the percept, right? A percept is neutral. It's just, it's what it is. But how you feel it is, is where it's all at, right? So this whole network gets activated. Uh, other regions of cortex. And this is what's called the pain matrix. And this is a salience network. Okay? Pain is way more complex than simple sensation. It's sensation plus affect plus a response. Your body's already responding, right? You know that. You feel it. Okay. So the pain matrix gets involved when you have pain acutely. There are disruptions in the pain matrix uh, as pain gets chronic. This is not just migraine. So, and it's actually not just pain, it's salience in general. If a giant clown jumped out in front of me right now, I'd be horrified and, you know, my pain matrix, my quote-unquote pain matrix, which was really salience matrix, would be activated. As migraine becomes chronic, there are chronic changes that occur in the various nodes in this network, right? Because this is all webbed together. And at first, we were very concerned because one of the changes you saw was thinning. Um, so you, your cortex is normally, you know, say this thick, and with chronic migraine or other chronic pain disorders, it got thinner. Is this a neurodegenerative disease? Are neurons dying? What, what's going on here? Well, it turns out, actually, the, the answer is pretty reassuring. Um, and the answer comes from conditions outside of migraine where you can study this very directly. Um, so it turns out there were, there, this is one example. There was a group of, of people with really bad hip osteoarthritis and they had rip-roaring changes in their, in their pain matrix or their salience matrix. Um, well, they went off and got surgery and when they got surgery, those changes completely resolved. So this thinning is not a degeneration it's probably a pruning of synaptic connections. The synapses are the ways neurons communicate. Um, so it's a tuning of the network, a dysfunctional tuning, a dysfunctional learning in the network, but a tuning nonetheless. It's not fate, right? It can be reversed. So that's 
another thing I could tell Lori is that, look, this is, yes, this is awful, this sucks, but there's no reason your circuit cannot be, yeah, yes, and it's chronically deranged. It's learned bad habits. It's ingrained uh, dysfunction. But that dysfunction be, can be unlearned. It's not fast. It's not like I, you know, strike a wand, be healed, right? You guys have heard that in, in headache, right? Anyone who tells you be healed in, in any way is, is sort of a charlatan, right? You can't just snap, change a dysfunctional network, right? It's, it's, it's slow, it's steady, but it can be done. All right. So that's, that's Lori's story there. Any questions on that? You can come up. All right. So, um, Philip is, uh, he's 56, and he's a, uh, he's a miner by trade. Uh, big, thick dude, big, thick neck, has been working manual labor his whole life, uh, lots of injuries, and if you test him by our migraine criteria, which are very fiddly and specific, he has perfect chronic migraine. But he swears, you know, this stuff, this, yeah, it goes to my head, but this stuff comes from my neck. This is, you know, this is not, you know, coming from behind my eye or whatever. This is from my neck. You know, and everything I read says that's not true. So what's the deal with this? Um, and this gets to the question of, there's a big debate in our field, which I think is a, actually a very silly one, about, you know, is this in the central nervous system or is, it, is this in the periphery? Um, and the answer is it's, it's both, really, right? So um, what do we need to explain this stuff here? So I think we need to understand something called the trigeminovascular system, and that's a horrible word. Uh, this is what happens when researchers come up with words and, and don't talk to other people. Um, but um, so where does pain come from in migraine? So all these spots that I showed you here, if I took an electrode and, and zapped that region, with one exception or two exceptions, you wouldn't feel pain. The, the, the brain doesn't feel pain. That's why you can do awake neurosurgical procedures. But structures on the brain, immediately on top of them, like the blood vessels on the surface of the brain and, and in the dura, the meninges, the linings of the, of the skull, vessels in the skull, vessels around the face, the skin, the scalp, all of these are heavily invested with very sensitive, pain-sensitive fibers, pain-specific fibers. So I'm just going to draw that, and these go in to something called the trigeminal ganglion, which is just a ball of nerves. You have analogous balls of nerves all the way up and down your body. Um, and then it goes into the central nervous system to something called the trigeminal nucleus caudalis. You don't need to know that. But the bottom line is that these fibers are exquisitely pain sensitive. Um, and they're probably there for a reason, right? You, you're, you're, your head is precious territory, right? It needs protected. Um, and there's some work going all the way back to the 1940s that studied pain-sensitive structures in the skull that you could never get away with anymore. They took neurosurgical patients and, and basically pulled and zapped and found out what, what places were sensitive. Uh, but the bottom line is we think that in order to start off a migraine, you, you need to activate these structures. And these structures aren't just in the head, they're also in the neck. There's plenty of very, very sensitive territory in the neck. Um, and there are probably multiple paths into starting off a headache. Now let me, I, there was one thing I wanted to pull up from Philip that I think is escaping me. Any questions while you guys are at this stage of things? Ah, you, you, you teed me up perfectly. Ah, there's, there's, there's one detail that I, I wanted to talk about. So we talked about, I, I should give you a little more detail about the reflex itself. And then I'm going to talk to you about treatments um, because that gets to the whole question of what's central and what's peripheral. So 
there are these pain sensitive structures. How do they start off a pain process, right? So if I prick my finger with a needle, it hurts and I pull off the needle and it stops, right? But a migraine's not like that. A migraine starts up in this creepy, slow or fast way, and then it just takes on a life of its own. It gets momentum. How does, uh, how does it do that? And that's where this silly word trigeminovascular reflex, trigemino, that's where the trigeminal nerve vascular, because most of these fibers are on uh, reflex. Sorry about the writing. Um, that's how this came about. So any pain nerve in your body. So let's just take the example of this crab that, that bit me. Uh, it, say it bites me really hard. That my, my finger gets red and inflamed, right? And, and you know, it, depending on whether the skin is broken or not, you actually get in, inflammation responses there. Well, it's not that different inside the skull. Um, every pain fiber is not just something that sends information this way. It's not just a collector of information. It actually releases substances. And those substances actually perpetuate the response. They, they, they cause it to amplify and to become regenerative. And two of these key substances are CGRP. And I'm only writing them because they're going to come up. Um, CGRP is calcitonin gene-related peptide. And this is a brand new class of drugs in trials. They're, they basically completed most of the main trials. And we're very hopeful that these will come into uh, <laughs> practice soon. PACAP is another one. They're going to probably work on, on suppressing it. It's another peptide. These things, it's a signaling molecule that's released that perpetuates the response. Another one, and this is a little subtlety, is nitric oxide. Um, and, there, and there's, um, ah, I won't go into that detail. There's a cocktail of things that get released. They perpetuate the response. They make it this sort of reverberating, continuing thing. Um, and that's this trigeminovascular reflex. There's also this trigeminal autonomic reflex, but you get the idea. So that reflex can, nobody's nailed this completely, but I think most of us are convinced that this can be triggered wherever you have pain sensitive nerves in the head or in the neck. Your neck nerves converge on the same places as your head nerves, right? And you can have pain from the back of the neck that refers to your eye, right? The, the typical migraine pain. So um, to answer Philip, yeah, it's, it's pro he's probably right, right? We just, our science hasn't caught up completely so that we can say definitively that he's right. But I believe he's absolutely right. Now, so his headaches are starting in the periphery, right? The, what we call the periphery. It's not the central nervous system. It's not the brain or spinal cord. It's out here, right? And that was, that was verboten for years in, in headache science. Oh, no, it all starts in the brain. And sure, it does. But no, it, it really probably starts in the periphery. What's the best evidence for this? It's the medications. So Philip responds beautifully to Botox. Botox is intentionally dosed outside the central nervous system. You don't really want Botox in your central nervous system. There's a whole other bunch of drugs. These CGRP antagonists, these ones in trials, these are antibodies. They, get, they, they, they don't pass the blood-brain barrier. Even triptans. So sumatriptan, naratriptan, all these triptan drugs that are so great for attacks or great for some people, not great for everyone. Um, there was all this discussion about them working in different places in the central nervous system. Well, it turns out they don't pass the blood-brain barrier very well. And then there's a whole bunch of neurostimulation techniques, you know, the, the little tiara, the cephaly device, there's this transcranial magnetic stimulation device. Um, some of them claim to act in the central nervous system, but the simpler explanation, Occam's razor, is they're being deployed out in the periphery. You've got a ton of sensors out in the periphery. Your brain's connected to all these sensors in the periphery. They're hardwired into the brain. You can modulate the central nervous system by, by acting on the peripheral nervous system. So you can trigger your attacks out, outside the central nervous system, and you can treat them outside. And that's why I think this, we, there's, at our conference this year, there's a debate, central versus peripheral. It's a, it's a silly question, syntax error. The, the question is ill-formed. It's both, right? We are designed 
with a brain that collects information from outside the brain, right? So, yes, his headaches are what we call cervicogenic. And that's still not really dogma in, in the headache circles, uh, that headaches can be triggered in the neck, that mi true migraines can be triggered in the neck. All right. Any questions on that so far? I yeah. Have a sure. I fully understood this. So, for me, um, and what helps me is they prescribe muscle relaxants that mm -hmm. have muscle spasms. Mm -hmm. Does that correlate with Philip? I, I think so. In fact, he, 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 he actually also uses muscle, spasms, uh, muscle relaxants. Um, so, your muscles. So, actually, the first way that people thought the Botox worked was by relaxing the muscles. And all of us neurologists said, Ugh, that makes no sense. Ugh, you know, it's all about nerves. Well, your muscles are filled with nerves. The way you know that your muscle is stretched versus contracted is a bunch of nerves in there. Sensory nerves and pain nerves. Muscle pain is one of the more profound forms of pain. And then you've got all these blood vessels that are richly, you know, densely webbed with blood vessels in, in all your muscles. So, relaxing the muscle per se is not directly addressing pain, except that all these fibers are not in tension anymore, right? And that's probably what's going on with the neck, right? You've got all these nerves in this, you know, tomato on a toothpick thing, right? It's a very unstable <laughs> device, right? And we splint our necks all the time. So, we poo pooed the muscle relaxing mechanism of, of Botox, but it probably has, has a role. And muscle relaxants, for some people they don't work at all, for some people they're wonderful. And I think that's how they work, is by you know, reducing that, that noxious input. Thank you. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, that's that's one of those mysteries. Um, my personal opinion, and by the way, I'm larding this with science and personal opinion. I'm trying to be as responsible to the science as possible. But but you know some of the things we have to speculate on or hand wave. I'm literally hand waving, right? So this is hand waving territory. I so imagine these networks, and something starts in one place in the network in your body, and then it, it activates certain parts of the network, certain nerves. Well, your brain's designed to learn. Your sensory networks are designed to learn. Something that gets, gets potentiated, that's actually a mechanism of learning in the brain, and it's, it's potentiation of synapses, is more likely to fire the next time. And then it's more likely to fire the next time. And so there may be sort of a winner-take-all effect that a place that started out as a trigger area gets grooved in, in terms of your sensory pathways, um, in ways that other areas aren't. And one corollary of that is that you can have a trigger that then goes away, right? But the, the percept remains, the, the network is, is already sort of potentiated along that, that line. So one side of the head versus the other. Um, one region of the head versus the other. That would be my speculation. But it, it really still is sort of in the mystery category. Does that make sense, at least as a made up explanation. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So next is Rita. And uh, let me just check what I wanted to point out from Rita's uh, experience. Okay. So Rita is 28 and she's fairly new to migraines and they've all been fairly stereotyped for her. Um, she has a classic aura, uh, not, not your visual one that we all think about, but a, an almost as common or almost as classic one that we call shero oral or another silly way of making something obscure that doesn't need to be. Shero is hand, oral is mouth. It's, it's an aura that starts in your hands and then kind of moves creepily up your arm and then kind of disappears for a bit and then it appears back in your mouth and your tongue. It's super creepy. Um, and after that, she has a rip-roaring headache, right? So she asks sort of a similar question to what you asked. Well, why this pattern? 
Why does it do this? And the same thing can be asked for why, why do you get a visual aura? Why, why does my migraine start in the way it does? Um, and to, to talk about that in an informed way, we have to think about something called uh, cortical spreading depression. So cortical spreading depression is, is another sort of unfortunate name because it's, it implies a, a decrease in activity. Um, and it was originally discovered by a researcher who was trying to study epilepsy. And he was looking at uh, rabbits, actually. And this is in the 1940s. And he, he was trying to induce epilepsy experimentally in order to understand it. And what he did was he did a, either a pinprick at this little S spot, the stimulus spot, or he did electrical stimulation. And he had all these little electrodes on the brain. So the electrodes are basically, they're just electrical sensors. They, your brain is an electrical organ. You put a piece of metal into it, and it will record just like, well, just like an EKG, right? An EKG is a little stronger, but it's the same sort of thing, right? So imagine these as little EKG strips on the brain, and normal activity just kind of looks like this. It just sort of squiggles. This is in, in a rabbit or a human. And he's got one comparing these two electrodes that looks like this. He's got one comparing these two electrodes that looks like this. Uh, you get the idea. Well, what he saw when he stimulated here was instead of what he expected to see was this. It's what you see in a seizure. He saw the exact opposite. He saw this. And then... <coughs> it moved. It moved to this electrode, and he saw this. And then this electrode. He saw this. So what he saw was a depression of activity that spread across the cortex from one electrode, from one sensor to another. And so that's how you got the term cortical, because this is cortex, the outer part of the brain, the sort of higher part of the brain, spreading depression. But Turns out this depression was actually exhausted brain after a massive, massive excitation event. So cortical spreading depression is actually a huge, what we call depolarization. It's massive activity that basically is so avid that it, 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 the, the neurons, the nerve cells actually just stop acting very much for a little while. And that's what, slow, that, that's what the depression is. Um, so actually, I can show you just just as a visual because I think this does help. Um, let me see here. So here's this is Liao Aristides Liao. He was a Brazilian researcher. That's his original recording. You can see the little squiggles squiggling down. But then this is using something called two-photon microscopy, and what we're doing is we're, can you guys sort of see that? Basically, the green is genetically labeled neurons, uh, nerve cells, and the red is blood vessels. And if you induce this event, you'll see this huge wave moving across the cortex. Right? The, the, the fluorescence of the nerves just goes way up. They're just firing like crazy. And if yeah, I know it's hard to see, but you can probably see the vessels are squeegeeing up and down. Um, so it's, this, it's a massive, massive event. It's one of the two ways that the brain sort of manifests toxic excitability. One is seizure that everyone's familiar with. The other is spreading depression. So um, we know from a variety of pieces of evidence that the aura is due to spreading depression. It moves across the cortex at the same exact rate. And people have been in uh, functional MRI scanners um, they're not actually measuring electrical activity because you can't stick electrodes into a person's brain. It's not ethical, except under certain circumstances. So um, they're measuring the vascular activity. You saw the vessels squinch down and dilate. You can actually measure that with functional MRI. And people can actually trace their aura. And as they're tracing their aura, you can see this wave of the vascular change, the vessel change moving across the brain. So we, we have pretty darn good evidence that this is the, the mechanism. But to get to Rita's question, why 
why here? Why in my sensory cortex, right? Why, why, why sensory? Why not motor? Why not? Why am I not paralyzed? Well, for some people that happens. But actually, a uh, uh, guy who has since moved on from my lab, uh, named Vladimir, actually asked that question: Why are certain parts are are certain parts of the brain more susceptible? And in a nutshell, what he found was that they are. Um, so he looked. Actually, we can just, well, I'll just draw another one. So this is a mouse brain from the top. It's a little simpler than a human brain. Um, but he, he basically exposed the whole brain to thresholding uh, stimuli to just see which area went off first. And what he found was constantly, 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 it just went off in this one region. This is called uh, barrel cortex. It's the sensory cortex of the mouse for their whiskers. So it's actually, you know, as you can imagine, a very, very important place for them. It's sort of like for us, our visual cortex. We're very visual creatures. They're very whisker-centric creatures. Um, no matter what he did, it all it all came off here in sensory cortex, not in not in motor cortex, not in some of the other regions in between. Um, and then, because these findings were so strong, I actually called a friend of mine who studies humans not with migraine, but with brain injury. And this is a situation where they actually can put electrodes on humans. And what, so I said to him, you know, Jed, this is, this is a wild outlandish question, but from your data, which is from people with severe brain injury, they've had their skull taken off, they've, they've got different kinds of injury, they've got electrodes on the brain, they're placed differently. I know this is a silly question, but do you see any sort of bias this way where these spreading to polarization events, which also occur in brain injury, are they coming off sensory cortex? And what he saw is basically yes. There's even, even in this very mixed up data set with people with different kinds of injury, different age, we controlled for all these factors. Um, it looks like the sensory cortex is more susceptible. So this actually answers a big question in migraine, which is, well, it half answers it. The aura. Is the aura because we don't know what it feels like to have a spreading depression wave going through this cortex here. You know, we're biased because we, we know what sensation comes from from sensory cortex, but we don't know from our, or is it because of the physiology, the, you know, the, the, the characteristics of that cortex? We can't answer the first one, at least not in mice and not in brain-injured humans, but we can answer the second one, that there may be a perceptual bias the, to why you sense your, your auras are sensory. But there for sure is a physiological bias. Uh, you know, the, there are different regions of the cortex that are more susceptible to this event. So Rita's like, okay, yeah, that's great. I, I gave her all this explanation. I was so excited, you know, hot off the press. She's like, yeah, okay, whatever. So what? You know, I, I can feel that off you guys. Uh, terrible, terrible. Um, but how does, how does spreading depression cause pain, right? That's, it, this is this thing that we just talked about. It's going through cortex, which doesn't feel pain, right? So the, in a nutshell, the reason is those big vascular changes, right? Basically, the, you get huge changes in the diameter of these arteries. These arteries have little sensory nerves on them. And that, that dilation constriction release of substances by the wave itself, then this sort of feed forward reverberating pattern that we talked about, that trigeminal vascular reflex. So basically, spreading depression, even though it goes through brain that doesn't feel pain, activates that trigeminal vascular reflex and sets off that chain of events. That's probably more relevant to you guys, right? <laughs> Rather than the, the why, why does this happen here or, or there? Is that also why, I mean, it, because of all of that happening, why get completely exhausted? That part is probably, again, now I'm in hand-waving territory, um, is activation of not just, so when, and actually, you've, you've led me right to the next step again. This is excellent. Um, so it activates pain, right? But what about the other, the other things that happen? So the exhaustion is one thing. The other thing is, what about all those sensory amplifications, right? That 
pain is different from light hurting, right? Pain is different from sound hurting, from smells being more noxious, right? Um, so what do we think is happening there? There's work done by another uh, person in the lab, Jeremy, where he basically studied the response of the cortex after spreading depression. And the bottom line there is for regions where that wave is passed through, the, you, you've got sensory information coming in before, you've got sensory information coming through after. The, the information coming through after is sharpened. It's both larger amplitude and it's more precise. So that may actually be a direct mechanism for how these sensory amplifications occur. But to the bigger question of what about the whole gestalt of the migraine attack, you feel all these other things, it's that this wave is coming along, it's getting, likely getting the vessels activated at some point over where they are, because there are vessels everywhere. That's going down into your pain sensing part of the brain and again, we're getting that cascading, spreading activation of the whole brain where you've got sensory activation, autonomic uh, response, and, and the, the affective side, the, the, the emotional, the, the mental pain side of things. Um, and the exhaustion is, well, another way I, I talk about it by analogy, and this is more, even more hand-waving, is this is a huge activation of the brain, right? This is like... Um, well, for example, it, folks will come in and talk about, you know, I'm not thinking right, I can't think straight, I can't do... But if we were to actually test you in clinic, you'd actually do okay. So the, the, the example that I give is a computer or a browser with too many windows open or a computer with its, with its RAM spinning, right? It's, you know, or a duck paddling frantically underwater except it doesn't feel like the duck who looks all cool and collected, right? It's, there's all sorts of stuff going on under the surface and that is exhausting that that's draining not to mention the the response of the body it's a whole body response it's this this autonomic outflow sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system outflow your body priming as if it were receiving an injury that's that's exhausting right I mean, for those of you who've been through an injury, right? What do you feel afterwards? You, you get out of it unscathed, maybe, but you're really wiped. You've activated this whole stress response of your whole brain and body. So it's very normal to feel exhausted. Let me think. I think that's, that's mainly it. I had this nice schematic, which is not like this horrible drawing here, but basically the idea is, the idea is that, that links Lori, Philip, and Rita is that this is a whole brain, whole body, whole person event, right? And that's, I think that's what the science tells us, but that's what we need to tell the scientists uh, as patients, patient advocates, scientists who are translational, we're trying to bring the clinic back into the lab to ask the right questions, is we need to keep this in mind all the time. All the evidence points in that direction, but we have a lot more work to do. What's specifically going on in all these circuits? And why is that important? Not just curiosity. It's, it's developing the next generation of drugs that are going to, or not even drugs, right? Maybe, you know, rewiring of different ways, you know, these you know, brain machine interfaces. Who knows? The new, new things that will come along. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. And uh, thank you all for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Sorry I was so improvisational. Uh, next time we'll have slides. Questions? Yes? I have a couple questions. Of course. That's right. So these two are, are deep mysteries in migraine. And so the, there's, there's, there's situations. We, we, we did a little series of articles once on, you know, 
how does a migraine stop, right? Isn't that almost more important than how a migraine starts? And there are these two situations where a migraine can stop almost like a light switch. Um, one is vomiting. Go figure. How? Why? We don't know. Um, the, and I could hand wave, but it would be so disreputably hand waving that I, I shouldn't. Um, I, if you force me, I, I will. But, um, and then the other one is sleep. People will go to sleep sometimes, and sometimes they'll wake up, it's horrible, afterward. Other times they wake up and, and it's gone. Not just like migraine hangover, you know, it's bruised, gone. No, it's gone, gone. Um, so, the, I guess the only somewhat responsible way I'll speculate is that vomiting is a massive autonomic discharge. It's a big, big, you know, surge from those sympathetic and parasympathetic control centers. Can that reset a network that's kind of spiraling downward? You just get this sort of giant jolt that, that resets it. I don't know. That, that, that would be the sort of where I, my gut would go on that. Sleep, similarly, I mean, that's, you know, we're talking about EEG. During sleep, your EEG changes completely. Your brain is a completely different functional unit, right? It's, it's, the, it's the same wiring, but it's, it's doing completely different things. So is that a reset of sorts? The euphoria, it's interesting. People can also get euphoria in the prodrome phase. So they'll be feeling better than ever, better than ever, and then, then a few you know, days later, then the, the, the reckoning comes, right? So um, uh, that one, I don't even know where to go with that one. I, I, I think it's just, it's probably too complex for us to understand. I mean, people can sort of invoke the hypothalamus um, and the limbic regions. Those, those are the regions that are known to produce um, these sort of ch changes in, in mood, um, but how they act, what triggers them, why, when, and how it can happen both in a sort of a creepy way and then on relief. I mean, one thing could be also that it's just the release from a horrible situation. Right, I mean, relatively speaking, it's you know you're feeling it, it's gone from really, really crappy to back to normal, and back then normal feels wonderful. All right, so that 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 would be my best I could do on that one. Yeah, you're asking the tough questions. What about when they never? So there, what we think is going on that that goes back to to Lori's experience where. She's got day in, day out headaches for years and years and years and years. We think what's going on is this is this is something that's become grooved in, right? You're, these these sensory pain networks have been potentiated, and they're just they they've learned to do this thing, learned to do this thing. But just like what we talked about, that is not fate. That's not destiny. These things can be changed. It's not fast, as you know, but incrementally. There's a beautiful article. Um, by, um, you guys ever read uh, Atul Gawande? He writes on medicine. He's actually a surgeon. And he writes on medicine. And it's called The, uh, the Heroism of Incremental Care. Or something like that. Incremental Care. Um, and it's in the New Yorker, but you can get it online. Uh, so he talks about how he, you know, it, it, even in medicine, you know, surgery and putting out fires, firemen, surgeons, that's the heroic job, right? You've got this appendix that's about to explode and kill someone. You go in, be healed. You take it out, it's done, right? But that's not how most of our disease works, right? Diabetes. It's not this heroic moment. It's, it's many tiny moments controlling that blood sugar. Chronic pain of any sort is that way. Um, high blood pressure, cholesterol, all these things that afflict most people that are our biggest healthcare burdens actually need incremental care. And there's a vignette in that, in that article about uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Elizabeth Loader, who over a course of five years 
five years of just tweaking, 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 slowly, slowly, slowly brought her patient from, you know, daily, daily horrible headaches with, with worse headaches on top to a day of pain freedom here. Wait, and then a few days of pain freedom. And nothing was miraculous. Nothing was dramatic. Everything was just methodical tweaking, coming at it from this angle, coming at it from that angle. And that's how, that's how we approach things. Um, if there were, for everybody, a reset button that we could hit, of course we'd go for it. But uh, most of our attempts at that sort of thing um, have led to, to worse problems, right? Um, and, and again, I'd be cautious of anyone who, who suggests things can just be instant. But there really is hope. There really is. It, these things are learned. It's not a degenerative disease. And, it, and th things that are diswired can be rewired. It just takes a little while. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So about the, having the mm -hmm. So I've tried the Botox and mm -hmm. the Botox um, that I have mm -hmm. But it comes from my neck usually. Mm -hmm. Ooh, when yeah, when something doesn't work, right? It, it's hard to say. It's hard to use that as a specific tool to understand because it's kind of it, it. It didn't do anything, so it's hard to say. It doesn't mean that the headaches aren't coming from the neck. It just may be, mean that Botox didn't get to where it needed to. Um, maybe it's these. This is a process that doesn't respond perfectly to Botox. That it responds to something else. Doesn't mean it's not the neck. Um, doesn't mean it's not other places either, right? I think most people probably have one primary trigger area and, and probably several others that, that are contributing. And remember, pain can refer. So you can get pain behind the eye that's from the neck. Well, probably vice versa too, right? So it's, it's a, that's where the, the persistence, patience, persistence, never losing hope, coming at it from different angles really is what makes the difference in the end. But it could easily be from the neck still. Yep. Um, some of the doctors that have come and talked about how migraine and depression or anxiety are in our Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. It's, it really comes down to when you, when you activate your, this salience network, there's, there's different parts of it. This is your anterior cingulate cortex, your amygdala, um, your prefrontal cortex, these are all regions that if you look at someone who has depression, they're, they're, they're either hypo or hyperactive, right? The, 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 but the bottom line is the network is disrupted. So pain disrupts the emotional brain as well as the sensory brain as well as the autonomic brain. It's just, it's part and parcel. Um, and, and I think physicians need to do a better job of being aware of that. Right. I mean, you guys all know that. It's, it's the doctors sometimes who, I mean, in our circles, they know this. But, you know, I think a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of this is educating the medical community, and a lot of this is educating society about this disease we all deal with. Right. Sorry, back yeah. to Lori. Yes. I'm going to follow up on her question. Sure. As far as the incremental care. So for those of us that do have chronic migraines, chronic everyday pain, mm -hmm. And it is a process, and mm -hmm. unfortunately it is a very frustrating process mm -hmm. to keep waking up every day, every morning, and it's like, as soon as you open your eyes, like, there yes. it is again. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. what are things that we can kind of keep doing every day to kind of keep ensuring that, you know what, today I did these three things, mm -hmm. and by doing these three things, I know I'm making a step towards that incremental care. Sure. You know, so it's not like, Okay, I cut back on my cholesterol today. It's a little more complicated than that. Yep. So do you have any suggestions? That sure, you? absolutely. Um, it's all the stuff that you've heard before. Um, sleep right, eat right. But I think the one, you know, you got your yoga mat right there, is this, the keeping your physical body as strong and as limber as possible. So we, I, I, it's almost to the point where I really love to just have us develop a little you know, yoga video, sun salutations for, for folks with migraine to just sort of 
unkink at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. There's, you know, this central peripheral thing is, is ridiculous, right? It's, it, of course your body affects your pain. Of course your body affects your mood. So keeping that wonderful machine as tuned as possible and that is incremental, right? If you, you know, yoga, Pilates, martial arts, all these things, there's no quick to them. There, it, it's, it's moving gently. I want to say ratcheting, but ratcheting is too violent a term for, for, for what good opening in yoga is or, or, any, or tai chi in any of these. Um, I think that's probably one of the most important things you could do. Is, is just keep keep that up and and know that it's not that too is not instant but just just as with a yoga stretch where you suddenly one day realize wait I moved a few millimeters more and that means that now this is all unchained and I can move better in lots of different places that applies equally to migraine it's you'll you get these small changes that then become big changes so what about Mm -hmm. Oh no no I'm I'm using those as examples. So there's the the way I think about it is there's things you you have done to you that can be incredibly helpful. They open things up. They start the process. I think of them as tr crutches or training wheels. So the the medications, the acupuncture, the, the massage, physical therapy, chiropractic, all these things can be incredibly helpful starting the process. But I think that in the long term, combining that with what you do to and with yourself, so you moving your muscles, you stretching your muscles, those two together are what can really make a difference. Plus, of course, medications. Plus, of course, all the other stuff that you guys know is the right thing to do. I'm not saying this is the only thing. Um, and it's usually and, not or. It's, it's both. Yep. All right, folks. I, I suspect we probably have to move on. So thank you all for your attention.